you think of the city of Pittsburgh today, maybe you picture something like this. Or maybe this. But it's doubtful you've pictured something that looks like this. But if you were alive 300 million years ago, you might see something that does look like this. Today, our travels will have us going back in time about 300 million years into the past. We're gonna get a good look at what Pittsburgh looked like during a period of time called the Carboniferous. We'll be heading to one of my all-time favorite fossil collecting sites to look for clues of our city's prehistoric past. Now, before you go to any rock wall on your own, it's always a good idea to have one of these. Even though these little rocks don't seem like they could do a lot of damage if they fall on your head, that is not a risk you want to take. I also bring this handy dandy rock hammer with me. This helps me to get the fossils out of the rock wall and actually see what's in here. So this particular rock wall that you're looking at right now, these rocks are what we would consider sedimentary rocks. What is a sedimentary rock? Sedimentary rocks start forming when large things like boulders or cobbles are broken down by water or wind into smaller pieces we call sediments. These little sediments get blown or washed to a lower location where they get all smushed together. Over millions of years, they get harder and they form into what we would call a sedimentary rock. These are some of the most common types of sedimentary rocks that we find right here in Pittsburgh. Limestone, siltstone, sandstone, shale? I bet you've got some in your backyard. Now let's head to our rock wall to see what kind of rocks and fossils we can find there. It's probably pretty hard to imagine now, but this rock wall 300 million years ago would have actually been a pretty swampy place. It would have been hot here. There would have been lots of strange ancient tropical plants, all of which are extinct now. This particular area might have even looked a little bit like modern day New Orleans. These are some really nice fossils I've found here. And while I don't always find fossils that look this good, sometimes you really get lucky. Like really lucky. When I find a rock that looks kind of promising, I'll tap it open with my rock hammer, split it, and sometimes you really just strike gold. Okay, not actual gold. We don't actually really have a lot of that in Pennsylvania, but I'll take this fossil. So you might find yourself wondering, how does a rock wall like this even form? And how did these fossils even get here? So what you're looking at right now these are what we might call siltstones, meaning that they're sedimentary rocks that form from what used to be silt, or really fine broken down particles of rock that dried out in layers and hardened over millions and millions of years. Now, in order for a fossil to form, there pretty much has to be some pretty ideal to perfect circumstances going on when the thing that becomes the fossil goes into what's going to become the rock. So say that you're a tree and it's your time to go. You fall over into the silty stuff, maybe in a swampy area like we had going on here, and eventually all of the material that made you up goes away. It rots away just like anything does whenever it dies, and in its place, new rock fills in and makes a rocky copy of the thing that is going to become the fossil, be it a dinosaur bone, be it a tree trunk, be it a leaf, so that rocky copy is what you're actually finding when you find a fossil in a rock. This area was a swamp. There were lots of trees, lots of leaves. Lucky for us, it's a great place to find fossils because trees and leaves, they break down a little bit slower a lot of times than say animal tissues do. So they tend to preserve pretty well in the right circumstances. Anytime you find a fossil, it's a good day because almost nothing comparatively fossilizes the stuff that does. So if you find a fossil, you are in luck. They're rare, even if they're considered a more common fossil. Now, in order to understand how Pittsburgh could have possibly been a giant tropical swamp in the past, you have to consider just how much it's moved. 
Okay, take this picture. These colorful shapes would represent the pieces of land that we would call our continents, right? The continents are actually only part of the story. The outermost layer of the Earth, you know, the one we're all standing on right now, is called the Earth's crust. It's broken up into several pieces that kind of fit together like a big puzzle called plates. Each continent might be part of a single plate or broken up over a couple different plates. Now these plates are always moving, and when they move, they tend to pull continents with them. So as you can imagine, some of the landforms that we've seen on this planet look very different from the landforms that we have today. Let's watch this model, which starts us 3.3 billion years in the Earth's past and takes us up to the present day to find out how the continents have moved through time. The green landforms on these maps represent the pieces of land that would eventually form into the North American continent that we know today. Here we go. Seeing as our rocks are about 300 million years old, give or take, here in Allegheny County, let's get a sense for what life was like in this region at that point. During the Carboniferous, our county would have been extremely close to the sea, coastal property. Now keep in mind also that our continent, or what would become our continent, we called it Pangaea back then, was located near the equator. If you think about how it feels to live near the equator today, you might get a little bit of a sense of what it might have felt like in Pennsylvania at that point. Now to set the stage here a little bit, one thing that's really interesting about this time period is that there was a whole lot more oxygen in the air than there is today. Today our atmosphere is about 21% oxygen. That's what the dotted red line is showing us here. You'll notice that right around 300 million years ago, that blue line showing oxygen in the air shoots all the way up to 35%, the highest that it's ever been on the planet Earth. So why is this important? Well, two things. Oxygen as a gas, first of all, is extremely flammable. 
This has caused some researchers to think that the skies could have been yellow or orange a good portion of the time back then. The reason why would be because when lightning strikes hit the ground and cause natural forest fires, all of the increased oxygen would help the fires to burn out of control, making the sky look a little bit like it does during forest fires today, but way more intense. So not only would yellow skies be a regular sight back then, oxygen also tends to correlate with huge animals. This lovely fellow, known as Arthropleura, could get up to nine feet in length and are relatives of modern-day millipedes. Here's Arthropleura compared to a muscly red shadow man. Then there was Meganura, relative of modern-day dragonflies. Looks so pretty. Except these ones had a wingspan of about two feet across. Here's Meganura compared to a shadow man in dress shoes holding a fly swatter. There are a lot of fossils in the Carboniferous of this ancient cockroach relative, called Apthoroblatna. These could get as long as two feet in length. Okay, let's take a little break from the bugs. Let's talk about some of the other types of animals we could find. On to the amphibians, the relatives of modern day frogs and salamanders. The temnospondyls were a huge order of animals that kind of looked like amphibian versions of modern day alligators and crocodiles. The different temnospondyl species ranged in size from pretty small all the way up to species in the Permian that were as long as 30 feet and weighed over 4,000 pounds. Temnospondyls tended to spend a lot of their time in the undergrowth of the ancient swampy forests. Believe it or not, here in Pittsburgh, we have our very own species of temnospondyl. It was actually discovered by a student on FedEx property near the airport, hence the genus name FedExia. Maybe that's why the illustrator chose black and gold for this picture. Now let's talk reptiles. What kind of reptiles were found here? The million dollar question is always, can I find a T-Rex skull in my backyard? The answer is unfortunately no, you can't, but that's only because our rocks in Pittsburgh are way older than those dinosaurs. We do, however, have some of the earliest known reptiles in the entire world, the reptiles that would go on to become the bigger dinosaurs and mammals. Some of these reptiles, like this Hylonymus, weren't much bigger than any of the little lizards you might see running around today. There were also larger species closer to the size of big alligators and crocodiles we'd see today, and even larger, like this Sphenicodon, being compared to a 5 foot 9 tall red guy. Another favorite is the Demetrodon. Now, Demetrodon is found in rocks that are kind of at the very edge of our age range here in Pittsburgh, meaning that they're found more commonly in newer rocks than we find around here. But they do match up with the rock age found in the southern part of our county in Washington County. Now, Demetrodon is thought to be a top predator of its time, chowing down on fish, smaller lizards, whatever was around. And it would have been quite a sight to see. So just how big was Demetrodon? Well, here's our human for scale again. So what would the oceans have been like? Well, by the Carboniferous era, life had existed in oceans for quite some time. So there's some really interesting animals that were swimming around. Weird sharks that are now extinct? Check. Enormous fish with really sharp teeth? You betcha. Sea scorpions? Wait, sea scorpions? Yeah, there was a whole group of animals in the sea that are related to modern day lobsters and crabs called the Eurypterids. Some were tiny, some were 12 feet long. You uh, might want to paddle a little faster. Now, maybe what I find most interesting about our rocks in Pittsburgh is what happened in the time period just after they formed. You see, this Carboniferous world was not to last. Things were about to change a whole lot through the Permian, and especially towards the end of the Permian. The blue line on this graph shows us the average world temperature by each time period of the Earth's history. If you look where it says Carboniferous, which is when our rocks formed, you can see that it was a pretty cold time in the Earth's history compared to the other eras nearby. Now, by a cold time in the Earth's history, I certainly don't mean that there was snow everywhere. There was definitely still parts of the Earth that were pretty hot at this point. Now, actually, the climate back in the Carboniferous, temperatures would have actually been kind of similar to they are today, 
The average global temperature, or the number that you get whenever you take temperature readings from all over the globe and average them over the course of a year, today stands at about 14 degrees Celsius, or 57 degrees Fahrenheit, and during the Carboniferous, it was pretty much the same. Temperatures started to rise dramatically during the time period known as the Permian, right after the Carboniferous. This was good for the reptiles' evolution, as they tend to do better in warm climates. Therefore, we started to see a lot of new species of reptiles show up at this time. But things on this planet were about to get crazy. Now, right at the end of the Permian, you'll notice our blue line, which tells us about average global temperature, takes a little uptick. This means the Earth's average temperature climbed higher than it had ever been at any point in the past, or any point thereafter. This uptick in temperature also coincides with the largest extinction event that this planet has ever seen. An estimated 95% of all life in the ocean went extinct around this time period, and 70% of all life on land. So what on earth happened that caused this massive extinction? Now one theory is that a giant asteroid from outer space slammed into the surface of the earth about 252 million years ago, leading to the massive extinction. This would be similar to what scientists think may have happened with the demise of the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. The asteroid theory has become a little bit less popular in recent years, however, because another theory has a lot of evidence. You see, rocks from all over the world, which are from that time period when the extinction happened 252 million years ago, contain volcanic ash. Analysis on these rocks, ash, and the other elements found nearby point scientists towards a hint that possibly massive volcanic activity is to blame. There's an area of modern-day Russia known as the Siberian Traps. The Siberian Traps are a volcanic province or area that's made up of several cracks or fissures in the ground from which magma or melted rock can flow up and seep out. Many scientists now think that these eruptions started about 300,000 years before the official start of the extinction and may not have stopped erupting until 500,000 years following the end of the event. So much lava came out that it could have covered a region the size of the modern-day United States of America in over half a mile of lava. Along with the lava, tons of greenhouse gases were emitted, toxic gases, which eventually led to the temperature and the climate changing enormously and very quickly. Parts of the ocean might have been over 100 degrees Fahrenheit consistently, meaning basically nothing could survive in them. While this extinction did mean doom for so many of the species on Earth, some animals were big winners. Meet Lystrosaurus. This reptile, about the size of a dog, was kind of dumpy, kind of slow, but very lucky and not a picky eater. Old Lystro here inherited a virtually empty world with not very many predators. Lystrosaurus makes up a disproportionate amount of all animal fossils found after the extinction. Now, if you're seeing some similarities between your bulldog and the Lystrosaurus, you're not imagining things. The group that the Lystrosaurus was a part of is one of our ancestor groups for all modern day mammals. After this great extinction, the world would change forever. Long after our rocks were done forming here in Pittsburgh, the world would see the rise of so many amazing species over the ages. If you can count on one thing in geology, it's change. And yet, some things stay somewhat the same. The modern ancestors of the far past are everywhere. You just have to go look for them. All of this, in my opinion, is what makes our rocks in Pittsburgh so special. You can go outside and find modern cousins of these ancient plants all over the place, even though they're different species and things have changed quite a bit. And yet, our rocks are from a lost world that was about to change dramatically after they formed. The Carboniferous Forest is a snapshot of a world that existed long ago and was very different, very alien from what we're used to seeing today. It doesn't get nearly the attention that the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, the dinosaur ages do, but I think the Carboniferous period 300 million years ago was pretty cool in its own right, don't you? If you like this video and you want to learn more about Pittsburgh's exciting geological history, 
check out my Patreon page. And thank you for watching.